Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Let's talk about The Many Saints of Newark, the Sopranos prequel that had fans hyped to see the origin story of young Tony Soprano. What'd you say? I said, hey, Joe Jerk, this is twat. What? But instead gave us Dickie Moltisante hitting for the Oedipus cycle and the most badass pinky swear ever. <laughs> Now, if you're like me, then you were pretty disappointed because the trailers promised us a movie focused on Tony. When I was a kid, guys like me were brought up to follow codes. And James Gandolfini's son Michael is such a dead ringer for his dad, you even feel like you're watching this character's true origin. But then the trailer turned out to be a bait and switch by the studio, as director Alan Taylor warned us. So when I watched this movie, it was really hard to set aside my expectations and actually watch the movie that David Chase and Alan Taylor made. But the second time I watched, I really absorbed the themes of the story and how this is a great prologue to the greatest TV show of all time. Think of this movie like an overture. In a musical, an overture introduces all of the themes that will be present in the rest of the show. And many saints tease up nearly every single theme that's explained Lord in The Sopranos. I'll talk about how, but first, let's get into what sucked about this movie. So first off, should have been a TV series, right? Or at least like a limited series? The Sopranos did a fantastic job of introducing subplots and side characters that enhance the TV show's overall theme. Like, for instance, learning that the FBI agent chasing Tony was cheating on his wife. It's a small detail, but it shows that everyone is a little morally compromised in this world. Now you can introduce these kinds of subplots in TV shows because a show is like a novel. It's sprawling, and a little messy, but a movie has to be tight, like a machine with no unnecessary parts. Introducing side characters like Harold with limited screen time feels like a diversion from the main story. Not to pick on Harold, he did serve an important purpose that I'll get into in a minute. In fact, I would have actually watched a whole series just about Harold that was Sopranos adjacent, or enjoyed this movie more if it were only from his point of view. But here, you could take out every scene with Harold and the movie wouldn't suffer for it at all. That's not good. Now my wife is a dramaturg and she pointed out to me that the Sopranos Sopranos is more of a long, extended character study of Tony Soprano. It's not a show where a lot happens or with dynamic characters or changes, whereas a movie requires dynamic characters, change, and resolution. And all of the Easter eggs and Sopranos baby stuff was so distracting. Little Steven's portrayal of Silvio was already a character of Al Pacino. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. But now, seeing this young Sil act exactly like older Sil, it's like a copy of a copy. She touched my peppy, Steve. Very distracting. At times, it even feels like this SNL sketch for the Young Tony Diaries. Carmela, you got a dime. Carmela, I told you, she was giving me biology oh, notes. what do you think, I'm an idiot? And there were so many other little callbacks to exact scenes from the show, or scenes that we'd heard about, like Johnny shooting Lydia's beehive hairdo. It all felt like fan service when what we really wanted to see was Tony and Jackie April holding up a card game. But now let's talk about what actually works in the movie before we dive into the larger themes that make this an essential companion to The Sopranos. The acting is pretty great across the board. The cast is loaded with Leslie Odom Jr., John Barenthal, Ray Liotta, and particularly Alessandro Nivola. And Christopher narrating the movie was a stroke of genius. It ties the movie into the present time of the show, does a terrific job of framing the story as a prologue to Tony's story, and ties the Soprano and Multisanti families together. The Sopranos always played with this mystical dream quality, and having Chrissy talk from beyond the grave helped us feel like we were in the same universe. Even little things like how Christopher as a baby couldn't stand Tony. You know, every time you hear him, he cries like this. And the explanation for this. Some babies, when they come into the world, know all kinds of things from the other side. So, now let's talk about how this movie carefully laid out the many themes of The Sopranos. For instance, Giuseppina Moltisante is another character you could probably cut out of the movie and it wouldn't really affect the story, but she is key to laying out so many of The Sopranos themes. Tony meets her when he's young, planting the seeds for the Italian fantasy woman that he met in the show. She's also trying to live the American dream. Maybe I come to America for America money. And this concept of the American dream, of making something of yourself if you work hard enough, is at the core of The Sopranos, the show. But as the show points out, the dream is mostly for white men, while who is like Tracy are thrown out with the trash. And in The Sopranos America, black men like Harold are used as tools or soldiers, but are never allowed to actually own a piece of the pie. I always wanted to join up, but I, I had two felony convictions. 
Jessapina is also Dickie's mother, which lays the foundations for Tony's Oedipal issues and his attraction to women who are exactly like his mom. Or did she remind you of somebody with that weird puss on? Like you don't like it. In fact, Tony observes or nearly observes every one of Dickie's sins, which he will copy later in life. He hears Dickie talking about his numbers game, so he runs one at school. He comes across Dickie killing a relative in the car, just like he will later kill Christopher. They both have fights with their gumars about their wives. Dickie gives him a pep talk in his room, just like he does for AJ. And there's also the meeting with the guidance counselors. And most importantly, Tony copies Dickie's temper. <laughs> Now, all of this is feeding into the Catholic concept of original sin, that every human is tainted with Eve's original sin of disobeying God in the garden. Therefore, none of us are pure and everyone is a sinner, except for Jesus and Mary. Except in the case of many saints of Newark, Dickie is committing the original sin. He's teaching Tony, through example, how to be a gangster. And this theme is repeated over and over in the movie, showing men with good intentions who are destined to become like their fathers or father figures. Dickie's dad beat his wife. Dickie later kills her. They even have similar fights. What do you want to rag? Every time I say something you don't like, you ask me if I'm or take Lydia, for example. We really get to see why she ends up in such a ragged mental state. Her husband is emotionally abusive and ungrateful to her. She is victimized and then demonized. But Tony still wants the best for her. He wants her to be that nice mom that told him the story of Sutter's Mill. The brochure for the pills shows a woman in a white dress with a gold sash, made to look like an angel. It's implying that if Lydia were to take this medication, this science-made communion, then maybe she would transmogrify into someone holy. Someone who is more than the common woman that these men treat like trash. And there's another strong biblical parallel with Jessapina and the way she dies. She reminded me of the woman of the apocalypse in the book of Revelations. This woman is set to give birth to someone pure, probably Jesus, when the beast tries to drown her sanctuary with water. In the same way, Jessapina is trying to create a new life for herself, a life of independence for women. And Dickie drowns her in the sea. But speaking to the theme of duality that we'll explore in just a minute, there is another parallel from Revelations with the whore of Babylon. This woman is said to drink the blood of the saints who symbolizes the fornication, murder, and sins of the kingdoms of the world. So let's apply this to the many saints of Newark. To Dickie and his father, she represents purity, a fresh start, a person who is new to America, born sexy yesterday, as long as she stays in the role that they expect her to play. Stay at home, cook food, and don't have sex with other people. And when she has sex with Harold, Dickie suddenly sees her as a traitor and impure, the whore of Babylon. Then he smites her with the sea like God flooding the cities of the world. She was a victim of her own dream, the American dream. The Sopranos featured characters trying to achieve the American dream, but the show itself was critical of that dream. The gangsters in the show are always wanting more, as if having more of something will make you happy. And in America, we define success by our money or the things that we have. There is this expectation that we are always supposed to feel happy all the time. So it's the trouble with you Americans. You expect nothing bad ever to happen when the rest of the world expect only bad to happen. Now in this movie, the idea that stuff equals happiness is criticized head on by Sally Moltisante. Pain comes from always wanting things. And Tony's greed is foreshadowed in this scene from Key Largo. He wants more, don't you Rocco? Yeah, that's it, more. That's right, I want more. Tony and the rest of his family are heavily influenced by gangster movies. Yeah, I want to write for the movies, good fellas, shit like that. They constantly quote the great films. Just when they thought I was out, they pull me back in. <laughs> and they think their trip to Italy is going to be like Vito's return in two. Don Cheech's villa. When Vito goes back to Sicily, the crickets, the great old house. So Tony is also learning how to be a gangster from the movies on TV. In the book that his mother read him, Sutter's Mill, was about the gold rush. This was the quintessential American story of wanting more. Gold is discovered in California and we flocked west to claim it. The gold rush spurred on the myth of manifest destiny, the promise of traveling west, the idea that happiness was always just over the horizon. But The Many Saints of Newark also shares its main theme with The Sopranos, duality. The tagline of the original series was, if one family doesn't get him, the other will, showing that Tony is always being being pulled between two lives, being a good man, a dutiful son, and a loving father, and also being a murderous, vengeful psychopath. This push-pull is always at the core of Tony's inner struggle. When he's on death's door, he even dreams of a fantasy version of himself who leads a normal life. This is my wallet. And this isn't my briefcase. 
but duality is all over the many saints of Newark. The movie begins with Dickie greeting his dad, who tells him, now I'm gonna have my second set of children with you. Also, Dickie is a second father to Tony. Later, Jessapina becomes a second wife to Dickie, who's actually the mirror image of his own wife. Dickie sees himself as living two lives, that of a good man who coaches blind kid baseball. You're a saint and also the life of a gangster. And his son Christopher also wanted to live two lives, as a filmmaker and a wise guy. It says in these movie writing books that every character has an arc. Where's my arc? Forget Hollywood screenplays, forget those distractions. And of course, there are two Ray Liotas, Hollywood and Sally. Hollywood is the tough kind of gangster that Tony, later in life, will try to be, like the tough guys that he saw in Hollywood movies. Yeah, that's it, more. That's right, I want more. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? The strong, silent type. While Sally, like his name implies, is softer, more of the feminine side of Dickie, the side that wants a family and cares about kids. Now, I think that Sally is the most important character in the movie, and I'm not even 100% sure that he exists. After killing Hollywood, Dickie goes to see his father's twin brother, seeking forgiveness or a way to atone. I want to do a good deed. But immediately, Sally owns up to his sins and accepts his punishment. I murdered a maid guy in our own family. I'm here for a good reason. You don't need to help me. Sally is pure. He practically leads the life of a monk. He doesn't eat dairy. He reads, doesn't smoke, and he has an almost divine gift for spotting Dickie's sin. I come see you. I do all kinds of good things. Maybe some of the things you choose to do aren't God's favorite. He even warns Dickie to stay away from Tony, as if he can foresee the dark path that he's leading him on, like he's hearing it from the other side from his great nephew, Christopher. He also talks about two dishes that his wife made that he says were perfect. The seven fishes, an homage to Jesus' miracle of feeding the multitudes with only two fish, and the other was tripe, a dish made from a cow's stomach. So you have a heavenly food and a lowly food. We see this division between the holy and the sinful all through the movie. Take the title, The Many Saints of Newark. This is the literal translation of the name multi Dante, Dickie's last name, and the name has a lot of meanings. There are many sides to Dickie, the sinner and the saint, but I think that more precisely, the many saints refer to all the gangsters in this era. In The Sopranos, characters are always repeating tales from this time, like these men were heroes or modern day saints. Uh, my brother John was a man among men. He was a saint. They're always framed in wide shots like Renaissance paintings, calling to mind biblical scenes like The Last Supper. But there are other saints in the movie. The street gang that's cutting in on Dickie's territory is also called the Saints. But Dickie sends Harold to tear these saints apart. Which brings us to Harold, the real enigma of this movie. So let's go back to that theme of duality. Two dads, two wives, two lives. Many Saints also shows us two Americans, white and black. Dickie thinks the Newark race riot is funny until it actually affects him. <laughs> For him, this opens the door to this other America. Harold is also Jessapina's second lover, showing that an immigrant is the bridge that divides these two worlds of white and black. She is neither accepted nor rejected, neither fully Italian nor American. All throughout the movie, we see this divide. When a well-to-do black doctor moves onto his block, Johnny moves to the suburbs to preserve this divide. Again, this teaches Tony the racist and segregationist views that he will later try to enforce in his own home. This is what I've been trying to tell you all along. You stay with your own people. So I struggled for a while with the character of Harold. He has a very compelling story. He's under the thumb of the white man before becoming empowered and trying to cut in on the mob. It's a great story, worth its own movie. But then, why is he always in the background? How does this fit? But then there was this shot. I think that Harold is supposed to be a representation of Lucifer, the most beautiful and skilled of God's angels who led a rebellion against the Lord and was cast out of heaven. This scene in the restaurant where he and Dickie see each other through the gunshot of the door is symbolic that they are two sides of the same coin, the fallen angel and the would-be saint. Harold is the devil, come to punish Dickie for his sins. He has become a divine instrument. And in many ways, Harold represents the end of this version of the mob. The Sopranos, the show, points out that when the Rico laws were passed, it allowed prosecutors to prosecute all mobsters at once, as long as they were complicit in the same crime. Christopher was actually born the same year these RICO statutes were passed into law. And because around this time drugs became a federal crime, the mandatory sentences for them were much longer. So what you had were many mobsters at once going up the river for decades instead of years, and they started to flip on their families. Harold and his crime boss talk about getting into the heroin trade. And in real life, white mobsters also tried to sell drugs, and this ended up bringing down their empires. In a way, it was drugs that brought that caused the mob a lot of their problems. When you get arrested for trafficking cocaine, that's 30 to life. 
Nobody can do that. So that's when they started writing each other out. Wow. And that's when, the, that's when the code of silence fell so. apart. So Harold with an AO is kind of like a Harold with an EA signaling the end of times for these saints. If only they had shared their spoils or allowed bright men like Harold a seat at the table, they would have all prospered. But instead, these saints were consumed with petty jealousy and pride. Pride, that great original sin, like how Junior's pride killed Dickie. And then there's that ending, the pinky swear. At this point in the movie, Tony has sworn off the life of crime. None of it! I don't want any part of this! And earlier, he used the pinky swear to promise to be good. I try to be good. Pinky swear. But back to that theme of duality, I think this shot implies the opposite. It's like Tony is seeing his uncle and promising, this won't happen to me. I'll be better. I'll be smarter. The ending to the show The Sopranos is all about showing that Tony is walking a tightrope between life and death. Because he could be killed at any time, he's like Silvio, both dead and alive at once. And this, this is the moment when he first steps out onto that tightrope the moment he really starts the journey of Tony Soprano. But that's just what I thought. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And while you're at it, be sure to let me know your favorite Sopranos quote. If you can quote the rules, you can f***ing obey them. And if it's your first time here, be sure to subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.